Well, I'm super excited to welcome on to Core Connections today, Dr. Pedre. So I always want to start out with, since you've not been on here before, is sharing a little bit of your story and why you are so passionate about gut health. And I know you've got your second book coming out soon, which I'm super excited about. And I know my listeners will be as well. Yeah. So, um, God, uh, how far back do you want me to go? <laughs> <laughs> whatever you, whatever you feel is relevant, you know, for sharing your story. Cause I know yours goes back a ways as does mine. So I totally resonate with that. <laughs> Yeah, so mine goes back all the way to childhood from um, just knowing that I grew up with um, a lot of gut issues and a really sensitive stomach. And actually, I remember suffering from a lot of constipation, which probably was related to my diet as a child. And somewhere along the way, I started getting infections like any child does, maybe eight, nine, 10 years old. And my doc, my parents would take me to the pediatrician and they would prescribe antibiotics. And then they would take me back a couple of months later and I had a sore throat, maybe I had sinus, who knows? Uh, I had a cough, probably most of the time was a virus, but they gave me antibiotics again. And they kept doing that over and over. So I was probably on antibiotics two to three times per year throughout my teenage years to a total of 20 plus rounds of antibiotics that looking back now as a functional medicine certified doctor and understanding the importance of the gut and the gut microbiome, I realized that what it did is it destroyed my gut microbiome and it led to leaky gut and a whole host of food sensitivities, especially to the two top foods that were in the diet of a teenager, which were wheat, like bread, pasta, and dairy. I mean, I loved ice cream as a child. And every morning, my breakfast was either Fruit Loops or Frosted Flakes with a glass of milk. And it was poisoning me. And we didn't know, realize that the reason my, my immune system was weakened was because of what was going on in my gut. The pediatricians were trying to get me to take multivitamins saying, you know, I need a vitamin to make my immune system stronger. Um, I need to exercise. When I was overweight as a child, then I became really skinny and underweight, I think, as my leaky gut progressed. And I could not gain weight no matter how much I ate. I probably, looking back, was eating like three to 4,000 calories a day. And I only weighed about 120 pounds as a, you know, full grown teenager. So you can imagine I was pretty, I was really thin, um, was eating a whole host of calories and I could not put on weight. And these are all symptoms and signs of leaky gut and having food sensitivities and waging an ongoing constant battle in my gut that just wouldn't go away because I kept eating the wrong foods and I did not have any sort of fermented foods in my diet. That was pretty rare, maybe an occasional yogurt here and there, um, but I was doing everything wrong. And honestly, when I went to medical school, I thought that this was just the way my system functioned. And by the time I was a doctor, I just thought, you know, I probably have IBS. I don't want to take medications for it. I just have to accept that sometimes when I go out to eat dinner, um, I'm not going to feel so great and I'm not going to know why or what happened. And it was really that I just didn't have a broad enough knowledge base on nutrition and what was happening inside the body. And I went on this, you know, just rabbit hole of education on that and discovered that what I thought was going to be a lifelong sentence of living with a sensitive stomach was really the consequence of eating the wrong foods, of having a leaky gut, of having a disturbed gut microbiome. And if I could restore that, then maybe I can come back to normal in some sense. Now, full disclosure, I don't eat gluten. 
I gave up gluten back in 2007. And I was honestly really, when I started reading about the connections between what happens in the gut, gut health and autoimmune disease, I became really worried. I was in my thirties and my mom had been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. My older sister um, had been diagnosed years before with multiple sclerosis. So, you know, in the back of my mind, I was thinking that, you know, the gut being the gateway to autoimmunity, that if I don't, don't fix my gut, I might end up with an autoimmune disease as well. And that was the motivation at the time. I, I wanted to um, prevent whatever what might happen into the future and completely revamped my diet. Took so out you... gluten, took out some other yeah. food sensitivities. Yeah. And, and then it just opened the portal to a whole new way of looking at eating, like even just looking at pesticides, eating organic vegetables, uh, making sure that I knew where my food was sourced from, being careful about what I chose when I went out to eat in a restaurant. And it wasn't an easy process. You know, there were many hiccups along the way. So it's not like, hey, I said, I'm gluten free. And I never touch gluten after that. No, there were there were hiccups along the way and hiccups when you go eat out and you don't realize that there's gluten in something. Right. Uh, it can get really tricky. And um, there's no there wasn't any, you know, perfection in the beginning, but I just kind of navigated that imperfect path, which is a great parallel for what I've seen, you know, and help my patients do and and all the people that have read my first book is understanding that you you learn as you go and you you work on developing those habits and you kind of refine and refine and refine um and uh what it led to is realizing i can eat a lot of the good foods that agree with my system and i just don't eat the things that don't agree with my system and that we can dive into that yeah. More, but you said, uh, yeah, you said a couple yeah. things that I want to kind of reiterate to everybody listening, because I'm a huge fan of people taking gluten out of their diets, um, at least experimenting with it, trying it, the dairy, you know, typically if people have a massive problem with gluten. They also have a problem with dairy as well. But I love that you said it wasn't perfect. And I think that that's so important to reiterate to people because so many times people say, oh, well, I tried and I didn't feel any difference. And so they think they never need to try again, or they're kind of in that whole like, or it's too hard. Do you know what I mean? So can you speak to a little bit more of that? Like, what do you say to your clients when they come to you and maybe they've obviously got some sort of health issues or digestive issues, something autoimmune, things like that. And we obviously all know it stems from the gut, but the initial thought is like, oh gosh, it's too hard to cut gluten out a hundred percent. Or can I just have a little bit here and there, you know, like talk about that because I think it's so yeah. important for people to really understand what it is doing to our gut and how it's, why it is so negatively affecting so many people. Well, just to kind of set the tone, usually the way I approach that and what I've learned uh, with working with hundreds of patients over the years is what I call stepwise activations. So maybe you know, and, and it's sort of a negotiation because no, every person is a, is a different individual. So some people can tackle this much at once, and some people can only tackle this much at once. So part of it is, and, and I talk about this in my new book, my upcoming book is, is really becoming intuitive about being really intuitive about your body and listening to your body and I think that is a really important part of this journey, but also tackling what you know you can be successful in to give you that small win that keeps you motivated and going. So maybe it's just taking out bread when you go out to eat. And that's the first level. So maybe, you know, maybe there are are three stepwise activations to get to 100% gluten-free. 
Maybe you don't go from from eating gluten to no gluten. And it's about conquering. Okay, so the first thing, let's conquer eating bread while eating out. Then second, let's conquer not having bread at home. So now we're taking out some really big sources of wheat. And But it, along the way, the per, I want the person to recognize and acknowledge the little wins because that's what keeps you going. It's so important when you're making these lifestyle changes to not set yourself up for failure from the beginning and be honest with yourself about how much can you take on at once. So sometimes I have people do one food, master that, and then add on the next one, you know, taking out these gut disruptors, gluten being one of the biggest gut disruptors. And we know this through the research, the scientific research, showing that gluten increases gut permeability. And it does this across the board. So they've done a test where they divided people into normal non-celiac gluten sensitive and people who have celiac disease who is which is an autoimmune intolerance to gluten that leads to a whole host of other problems what they found was that yeah gluten does increase intestinal permeability the most for people with celiac disease that's not surprising right if you ask anybody who has celiac disease they have a little bit of gluten it can cause an exacerbation it can set them back for two to three days sometimes for an entire week, depending on how sensitive they are. Then you have the next level, what we call the non-celiac gluten sensitive. That's me. So that's you can me maybe, too. So <laughs> yeah, so, you, so yeah. you can maybe navigate and you might tolerate a little exposure to gluten, but turns out that the non-celiac gluten sensitive, when they're exposed to gluten, it also increases gut permeability. And the reason that this is bad, and for anybody who like they're wondering like, okay, what's this fancy term, gut permeability? It's another way to say leaky gut. Imagine your gut like a border patrol and it's got gates and it's only opening them to let nutrients in. But if you have a leaky gut, it's like, like basically breaking one of those gates. So now stuff can get in, the border patrol can't stop it, causes unregulated inflammation in your body. And it leads to a whole host of problems like mental fog, like weight gain in the middle, um, fatigue, joint aches, all sorts of things. So the celiac has the highest reaction, the non-celiac gluten sensitive. But you would probably think that if somebody's normal, that they shouldn't have <laughs> any effect from gluten. Yeah. And what they found is in this particular study was that even the normal person had some element of increased intestinal permeability because the way that gluten affects the gut, it causes the release of a signaling molecule that's called zonulin that basically controls the permeability of the gut, kind of like a dimmer switch. So it can increase, it can decrease it. And this is a very important function. You know, we can't we can't be isolated from the outside world. We've got to let some things in so we can get our nutrients. But we have to be careful about letting bigger molecules through partially digested food proteins. Um, they've shown that bacteria can get into the bloodstream. Bacterial DNA gets into the bloodstream from the gut. This has been proven again in studies looking at leaky gut and something called endotoxemia. And so the way I look at it is that you might be normal, but gluten is affecting your gut at cer a certain level. And certainly there are sometimes genetic predispositions. Some people are predisposed to getting celiac. So that's one mm -hmm. factor, but genetics is only one part of the coin. It's genetics and the environment. But if you're normal and you overexpose yourself to gluten continuously, over and over and over and over and now an accumulation over a lifetime it's very likely that you'll develop leaky gut and you can develop all the other downstream diseases that might come with leaky gut and the thing is that we used to think that celiac disease was was a disease of childhood it was taught in pediatrics when i was in medical school it's something that's diagnosed early in life. What we have learned since then 
is that people can develop celiac disease later in life. And probably my oldest diagnosed celiac patient was a 52 year old woman who no one could figure out why her thyroid was malfunctioning and why she wasn't mm -hmm. feeling well. And I did a workup and found that she had celiac disease and we had to take gluten out of her diet. Yeah. You know, so you'll probably hear, you know, and I don't know if your listeners, if you've interviewed other people will say, well, weed has fiber, weed has important nutrients. Mm -hmm. I think the Ben say I have, yeah, I don't have, I have not had anyone on here that supports eating gluten. <laughs> so <laughs> I can tell you, I can tell you that there are those out there and there are other MDs, actual medical doctors yeah. who support gluten, um, eating wheat. I think the problem is, is that there are different types of wheat and the type of wheat that is, that is yeah. mostly used in the United States, uh, which is a dwarf wheat is so highly glutenized because of the way it's been hybridized that it has 30 to 50% more gluten than the ancient wheat that people used to eat. So having been in New York and having patients that come from all over the world, I've had patients from India who tell me I can eat wheat based products in India, but when I come to the U S yeah, they, they make me sick. Same thing with Italy with other, because they're using a more ancient wheat over there. Right. I think now little by little, those things are, are changing. Uh, but I think that that speaks to something really important about um, how we evolved to eat our food in a certain way. And if we try to engineer our food to evolve much more rapidly than what we can adapt to, that it perhaps creates harmful effects in the human body. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you for explaining all that because I always just, I feel like sometimes people need to hear it over and over and over again. And I mean, I've had a lot of women that have reached out to me and said, okay, Erica, I've listened. I've heard you say it a thousand times, like take the gluten out, you know, and sometimes it's just an experiment. And I think too, and I'd love your perspective on this too, but I think sometimes it's all about like experimenting with our body and kind of like you said at the beginning, it's, it's not about being perfect with things. And I think so much society has set us up to like, it's like a diet and you have to do this exactly this way or else you fail and it's not even worth trying. And I think that's really what actually sets so many people up for failure, especially when it comes to nutrition. And you and I both know, right, they can, people can be taking the right supplements and all that, but if we're not shifting the foods that we're eating, we're ultimately not going to have the right microbiome in our gut to The food lead is to the foundation. <laughs> Yes. The, the, the food is the foundation. And I do want to speak to briefly about, you know, the journey of going gluten free, you okay. know, because yeah. like I said, from the beginning, um, going gluten free and, and in my upcoming book, the gut smart protocol, I do recommend, um, staying away from gluten. Uh, but it has a very tailored plan that's designed with a quiz to understand what your level of gut dysfunction is and what foods you mm -hmm. can and cannot eat. I love but that. the one the one thing to understand about this, you know, having worked with hundreds and hundreds of patients is that when you go gluten free, yes, it is an imperfect pathway. Yeah. But to get to the point where you can really say that taking gluten out of the diet made a difference and created a a recognizable health effect in your body. A lot of times you have to get to that point where your gluten intake goes to zero. Mm -hmm. So maybe it takes you a month to get there. Maybe it takes you two months. And once you get there, then the clock is now ticking because now we're really testing. And sometimes it does take getting there. And I, I just want to share my my own journey. Yeah. I, I, you know, I talked about autoimmune disease and my fear, my family's autoimmune disease, my fear of getting autoimmune disease. I did a blood test that showed that I was gluten sensitive and luckily didn't have celiac, but I decided, okay, now I can't deny it. I'm, I'm a medical doctor. I wanted the, the hard evidence that I couldn't eat gluten, even though I already knew you know, I intuitively yeah. <laughs> knew that I should not, but I needed that little extra. So I needed to see it in a blood test 
And when that came up, lit up in a blood test, I decided, okay, I have to surrender and I'm going to go gluten-free as best I can. And I actually did quite well. And I decided initially that I would do it for a month. Well, within two weeks, I had such a burst in my energy and my mental clarity that I was like, okay, let's, let's see how I feel at the end of a month. I felt so much better four weeks into being gluten-free that at that point I decided, well, let me do it for three months. Let's see what happens if I do this for three months. So I did it for three months. And at that point I thought, you know, I'm taking probiotics. I'm starting to eat fermented foods. I'm really, you know, eating clean. Let me try having some rye bread when I went out for brunch. When I had a slice of bread within 10 minutes, and now I know this is one of my telltale signs, I started itching on the inside of my wrist, like really faint. And I actually even saw like a very faint redness. This had never happened before. So I think this is really important for people is that when you are creating the blank slate in your gut, by taking out a food that is a gut disruptor, that it's possibly a food sensitivity for you, that when you reintroduce it to test the food, a lot of times it's going to give you a very clear read, but it might be something that you never had before. And you wonder, well, why? <laughs> why is this happening? Why is my immune system, why is it showing up now and it didn't show up before? Well, it's, it's a bit of a complicated science, but it has to do with overwhelming the immune system with so much antigen, like pieces of gluten, that you actually create what we call um, immune complexes that form circles. They don't kind of like hold hands. Your, your immune um, immunoglobulins are like these goalposts and they can get stuck together. When that happens, it's almost like you're not being exposed. It's protecting your body in a sense. But you don't really know what the damage is that it's doing. You're fatigued. You're mentally foggy. Maybe your joints are achy. You know, there are all these things that you think, oh, maybe I'm just getting old. Yeah, my doctor told me this is just a part of, of aging. And then all of that disappears. But when you have a little bit, it doesn't have to come back in the same way. And what I learned, my telltale sign, if a food disagrees with me, is a very fun fine, faint itch on the inside of my wrist. Mm. And you can only, you know, so during this process, this one thing that I always teach patients is the importance of self-awareness and to really observe your body because if you're not, it would be really easy to just brush off like, okay, I have this weird itch that just appeared, but maybe, yeah. maybe it's due to something else. Now, the reason, so this is the other thing that I think is really important is looking for patterns, you know? So if something happens one time, that's not a pattern, right? It's an interesting observation. So I gave up gluten again for three more months. So I'd been three months tested, got the, the itch on my wrist, went another three month cycle, at six months, I decided, okay, I've been really good. I'm going <laughs> to test this out again. Same thing with rye bread. Within 10 minutes, I'm itching on the inside of my wrist. I think it's interesting, like, too, that it wasn't a necessary, like, a gut response. I think so many people think, oh, no. well, but I don't feel bloated or this and that. It's like, but there's so many other things because it causes an inflammatory immune yeah. response, right? And, and, and by the way, the gut response came the next day when I was running to the bathroom oh. and not feeling so great. So, there it is. you know, the gut response can be delayed by 12 hours, 24 hours, even 72 hours. But there I saw the pattern and, and then I knew, okay, this is, there's something to this. So then I went another six months, same thing happened when I retested and that, that was already the year mark from having gone gluten free. And at that point I decided, okay, I'm going to commit to this. I'm just going to 
stay gluten free. And if I want to cheat from occasion, because I also think it's really important to not be a hundred percent orthorexic, like, you know, because then you start feeling like you're, you're living with a straight jacket. So like, look, if you're at a birthday party and you want to have a piece of cake and you're gluten free, but if that's what you want to do, as long as you understand that there's going to be a consequence from that for your body, um, but you're giving yourself the license so that you don't feel like you're walking around life with a straight jacket on. I think that's also really important uh, because that to me is a part of self-love and self-compassion. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny because the same thing over time has turned into the reason I don't have gluten is self-love and self-compassion because mm -hmm. I know what it yeah. does to the body long-term. Exactly. And, and I try to convince people to do the same for themselves, to honor their bodies, to, to recognize when you're feeling your best, what is it that you're doing? What are the activities that you are doing? How are you eating? How are you living your life? How are you exercising? What is your mindset? Um, and I think all of those pieces are really, really important part of the entire picture of creating health. I love this. So, so many good words of wisdom. So I want to shift gears a little bit and I want you to talk about your trip to Africa because I feel like that was a very eye-opening moment for you, but you also have so many good nuggets I know to share that really can just give us some insight into more of the foods that we really should be eating for our health. Yeah. So this was a trip that uh, I was invited to go on safari but also more more importantly i was invited to to spend three days and two nights with the hadsa hunter-gatherer tribe in africa it's one of the last hunter-gatherers on the planet and they truly do live off of the land and so it was a very small group only 10 of us and we went and we camped with them we did not speak the language but somehow um, I learned that humans can communicate even if you don't speak the same language through like facial expressions, sounds, gestures. Um, and we had this one night that kind of, it reminded me of a Star Wars moment. I don't know if you ever saw Return of the Jedi. But I'm not I'm, a big Star Wars person. I'm a big <laughs> Star Wars fan. But anyway, there's a night that that the robot C-3PO is telling a story about their their space adventures, and he's speaking in a foreign language of the Ewoks. And that night, we're sitting by the fire with the Hadza chief, and he's telling us these stories, but he's making noises. And we knew, like, he's putting a face and knew, oh, he's talking about a lion, or he's talking about a giraffe, and he would go like this. And so it was... It was just an amazing experience, but what was really cool about it and why I was so excited about going is because I had seen studies done on the stool of Hadza, of pe Hadza people, and they've done PCRs of their stools and looked at their microbiome in comparison to a control group microbiome. They chose a group of Italian controls, and you can imagine the Italian diet is a Mediterranean diet, one of the healthiest diets on the planet still proven by research. Mm -hmm. And yet the Hadza had a much more diverse gut microbiome than the Italian cohort. Now there's a lot of different things. So Hadza are not exposed to antibiotics in the same way that Westerners are. And in fact, I asked the chief, you know, do you ever if you ever take an antibiotics there, they are aware of, you know, you can't live, you know, the, 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 the bush is being invaded by the modern world. So, so they are aware of the world outside and they even are aware that there are hospitals and it took uh, a number of questions to finally get at that. If, if one of their tribe members was super sick, then they might go to the hospital. But most of the time, what they do is they have their own herbal remedies and they've been passed down generation to generation. And I asked them what they were and he's like, it's it's se tribal <laughs> secrets. We will not share it with anyone. And, and so um, 
they haven't been exposed to antibiotics in the same way. But the other thing that I came to appreciate is that they are living in the natural world, being exposed to dirt, touching the earth, like touching animals they go and they hunt but they also gather so they're looking for root vegetables that they dig up from under the ground and i went with them on one of those expeditions and they just dug up a root vegetable imagine that it was comparative to like jicama and with a knife they just cut it open right there and they gave us bites to eat of this root and they're not washing it off or anything so you're also getting like the dirt, you're getting the microbes the, and the dirt and all of that. Yes. <laughs> yes. So you're getting the, the microbiome from the dirt. And the, the part that was even wackier than that is that there are these bees in, in Africa. I was in Tanzania that make beehives inside a tree trunk. And the only way you can know that the beehive is there is that you'll see like a tiny little chimney, an air duct sticking out mm. of a branch. I don't know how they spotted it, but they are expert <laughs> trackers, hunters. Like it, it's just amazing the you know the the skills that we've de-evolved away from that can be retained if you're you're out in the wild. And so they spotted this and they went and they cut open the branch. And inside was this honeycomb. Now you have to imagine that these bees in Africa is a species where they look like tiny little flies. They're bees, but they're really tiny, strange. And then they just pull the honeycomb out and they eat it raw. Now we know all the benefits of raw honey. It boosts the immune system. It's really good for the gut microbiome. And, and so, and they just said, put, they asked me to put my hands out and they poured honey into my hands with, you know, honeycomb. There was probably like two or three bees trapped in there and they're like, eat. And so <laughs> I ate and it was delicious. Yeah. I bet it, it was, was some really of the best honey you've ever had. Was oh, it, it was, it was. <laughs> amazing it was amazing and we know that this is how they sustain themselves and you have to look at that and think okay they're not eating a huge array of different foods like we have access to in the western world and yet their gut microbiome is preserved in a way that we have lost even with all the foods. But the problem is, you know, there's so much processed food, there's sugar, Mm -hmm. there's exposure to antibiotics, alcohol, so many things that are gut disruptors that destroy the good bacteria. And it's very hard to rebuild that if you're not eating the right foods. So this was really illuminating about the pathway to healing the gut and the importance of being outside in the natural world and and just exposing yourself to, I mean, I think one of the best things that you can do is have your own little garden with organic soil, grow some vegetables and just, you know, work in your garden, get your hands dirty, eat food from your garden. So you can get that exposure to the natural world that is, I think, a very important missing component of taking care of the gut microbiome that a lot of people, you know, we, I I don't think enough people talk about it. You know, we talk about probiotics, we talk about the right foods to eat. And I, and I can go deeper into like, what are good foods for the gut? What are not such good foods? Um, But this, this trip was just, you know, really mind blowing as to how far, you know, I know, you know, I, I love living in the modern world, so I'm not anti. I don't want to go out and become a hunter-gatherer. <laughs> but at the same token, I think we need to remember that part of us being these biological beings on this earth is being, and part of what makes us healthy is that interconnection, interaction with the natural world that allows the education of our immune system through our gut and our gut microbiome that to make us more resilient. Yeah, I think being in nature is so, so important and something we don't 
do enough of, even those of us, I try to spend a good amount of time out in nature, but even then I'm like, I'm not eating the dirt, but I was like, maybe when I do my garden this year, I'll, I'll, when I pull out the carrots, I'll just brush off the dirt and have everybody eat carrots just straight from the garden. Right. Cause if that's what we need to be doing more of, I mean, we know it with, you know, kids, I've got three kiddos and I talk a lot about kid, you know, kid health as well. And I think it's something that, you know, kids, you talk about, you know, overuse of antibiotics and things like that and getting kids to like play in the dirt. I remember with my oldest, cause I was, I, my mom was a microbiologist growing up. So she was all about like germs actually are good to a point, of course. Um, and so I remember my oldest, when she dropped her pacifier on the ground, I just brush it off unless it fell into something icky, you know, really icky or whatever. And I put it back in her mouth and some moms would just be mortified at that. But w- my oldest has like, I think she's been on maybe two antibiotics ever for like inner ear infections that I just could not squash with the natural stuff. Right. But for the most part, Like I've seen it in my kids when you really get them in the dirt and like go eat some sand, right? I know that sounds kind of crazy, but at the same time, I'm like everything you're saying, that's what we need to be doing more of. We've got to step away. And I think after, you know, the last couple of years, I almost think we've probably gone even more extreme and anti-germ and we need to shift it back or we're going to have this whole next generation of even sicker kids just strictly because we're like over washing hands over over doing the anti-germ things when we actually need those things to help build up this diverse microbiome so that all of us and kids in particular can be healthier that's a really key word that you just said is diverse or diversity and what that means is that there is a wide variety of the types of bacteria that are living inside the gut, bacteria, viruses. You know, we, we all have a mix of things. And even they estimate that 10 to 15 percent of what's in the gut is what we would consider unfavorable or harmful types of gut bugs. But in balance, inside that ecosystem, they serve a purpose the same way that a predator serves a purpose in the rainforest that keeps the entire ecosystem in balance. The problem is that I think in the modern world is we've gone, we've shifted that balance. There's too many predators in our gut because of antibiotics, processed foods, too much sugar, stress, alcohol, et cetera, and not enough of the good bugs. Uh, but that that diversity is what is lost and I think is being rapidly threatened in the modern world. Um, And especially Mm -hmm. in other countries where you can buy antibiotics without a doctor prescription, you know, at least there is a bit of a gatekeeper in this country. But even then they found that antibiotics um, are overprescribed, um, oftentimes given for, for infections that do not require antibiotics. And good on you for keeping your, your children. I did the same. I have a son and I was very astute about uh, keeping him away from antibiotics. Um, There was that ear infection when he was seven years old that nothing was budging it. And yes, Mm -hmm. we had to go on antibiotics for that. But I also felt really proud that he had not been on a full course of antibiotics until this age of seven. And Mm -hmm. before then, I just didn't take him to the pediatrician because I knew they would want to prescribe antibiotics. And Most infections are viral. Now that said, if you have a child, you know, always check with your doctor, but (laughs) ask questions, you know, because I can tell you as a doctor um, and trained in the pharmaceutical driven medicine that a lot of times you just want to write that prescription to satisfy the patient and get them out the door and make them feel like you did something for them. You know, instead of saying, you know, it's just a virus and let's just support your immune system and you're going to have to give it time. You know, there's no magic wand yeah. to to improve it. Um, and again, caveats and caveats. And I, I talk about it in my book. I've saved people's lives with antibiotics. So I'm not anti antibiotics. I'm not here saying we should never use antibiotics, but I think we should use them judiciously and discriminately uh, because ultimately what we need to do is protect the diversity of the gut microbiome. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a time and a place (laughs) that's really what it, you know, it comes down to, but there's so many natural, 
natural herbals and things that we can we can support the body with. Um, like I always, for ear infections, I always just like to chime in and remind moms, like the garlic drops are so amazing for ear infections. Does it work a hundred percent of the time? No. especially if it's a deep inner ear infection, but like swimmer's ear and a lot of the other things that kids get, if you catch it right away, you can, you can kick it. And then you just saved your kid an antibiotic. So I always love stuff like that. So, and I, and um, I was just reading um, just a quick mention yeah. uh, for women who get UTIs that going on one round of antibiotics uh, they found usually predisposes them to getting a second UTI and going on a second round of antibiotics within six months. And you wonder why is that? And it's because of the gut. So every time you go on a round of antibiotics, you should be doing the things that help rebuild the microbiome because you've disrupted your microbiome. And one five-day course of Cipro, which is one of the most commonly used antibiotics for UTIs, can take your gut 12 months to recover from. And that's if you don't so, go on another one. <laughs> and that's if, exactly, which is yeah. what happened to me, is I was going on, on antibiotics every couple of months, like every six months or less. And so my gut never recovered. But if there were things, if I could go back in time and know the things that I know now, like the Stanford study that came out last year that looked at how can we improve the diversity of the gut microbiome, is it a high fiber diet or is it a high fermented foods diet? Which one is better for the gut microbiome? And what they found was really surprising because we think like eat fiber, fiber is so good for mm -hmm. you. You should eat a lot of vegetables. And, and I'm not saying you shouldn't. But what they found in the study was that it was the fermented foods mm -hmm. that increased the diversity of the gut microbiome and lowered 19 different inflammatory markers that they were testing for. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I personally feel good, better when I eat some fermented foods. So that's probably why then. Yeah. It's yeah. eat more fermented foods. And it's interesting. Think about it, right? It's how we used to preserve food. With and <laughs> with, with caveats, uh, which yeah. I talk about in my new book, The Gut Smart okay. Protocol, because Good. by dividing people into three different categories of gut dysfunction, mild, moderate, and severe, mm -hmm. what I found is that people who classify under the severe category actually can't tolerate fermented foods. We've got to heal you up and get you into the moderate category, and that's when you can start to introduce some of the ferments. So, you know, that's why I felt like it was so important to kind of demystify and break down gut health because it's not a one size fits all. It's really something that needs to be personalized. And, you know, if you're out there and hearing like, oh, ferments are good, I should be eating fermented foods. But if you have severe gut dysfunction, you're going to probably feel worse if you introduce them. You've got to wait until you've improved certain parts of your, your gut health, and then you can start to introduce fermented foods. So it's, it's, it's a bit complicated. And that's, that's the type of wisdom that I wanted to put into this new book, because I think that there's a lot of great advice out there about what are the healthy ways to eat. But I think we need to understand that we need to filter that down and individualize it and understand what is right for my body right now in this moment. I love that. I love that you have a quiz in your new book to help guide people versus just saying it's this way or that way, because I think that's so important because it is so, it is so individualized and some of us have much more uh, complex complexity going on. And some of us have done a lot of healing and, you know, but still have a ways to go. So I think that's really, really awesome. Um, okay. There's a couple other big questions that I have, and I hope we have time to get to, but one of them, as I know that you talk about breath work and mindfulness and meditation in your new book. And I wanted you to hit on that a little bit because I know it's really easy with gut health to be like what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat. And then, ah, oh, does that add our, add to our stress, which could be negatively impacting our gut health. <laughs> Yeah. And one thing I like to say is that you cannot out eat or out supplement a stressed out lifestyle. Mm -hmm. yep. So in other words, 
if we were to put a hierarchy of the things that need to be done, if you're going to be like checking off all the things, you know, but being really type A and you're stressed out and you're rushing and you're eating at work and then you're rushing to meetings and, and dinners and your, your life is unsettled, it doesn't matter if you're doing all the right things because your nervous system is on hyper alert and it ends up causing vagal nerve malfunction. And I was just talking to a patient about this the other day because they were going through a stressful period in their life. And I'm sure anybody can relate to this. You go through a stressful period and suddenly you have a knot in your stomach. Food doesn't sit quite well. Feels like food um, takes forever to digest. Well, guess what? That is a sign of vagal nerve malfunction. So we all, vagus is the biggest nerve in the body. It runs from the brain through all the internal organs and it controls communication between the brain and the organs, but also from the organs back to the brain. So it's very integral to this thing that we hear about, the gut-brain connection. And it's happening in both directions. And there's something called vagal tone that if you are old enough to remember when there were wired phones that you picked up and when you picked up the phone, there was a dial tone and it sounded kind of like a, and you knew that the phone was working. And if there wasn't a dial tone, the phone was dead. Well, same thing. Vagus nerve has a tone to it. And when you're under severe stress, when you're under big stress, like say you just went through a breakup and you're really upset about it. Well, that can disrupt your vagus and it, and it lowers your vagal tone and then you can't digest food well because your vagus is an integral part of controlling how your stomach produces stomach acid and digestive enzymes, as well as movement down the digestive tract that controls things like peristalsis, the rhythmic contractions of the small intestine that help keep you regular. So breath work is a really key, important part. You know, this is just a long way for me to get there that you can't ignore stress, all right? This is what I'm saying. You <laughs> cannot ignore stress. You can't think like, oh, I'm going to eat all the right things, but I'm going to stay in my stressed out lifestyle and I'm going to fix myself. Well, no, you can't. You can't bypass that. And I can say this with confidence with my 20 plus years of experience as a doctor that I've learned that if there is a hierarchy of things, stress needs to be modified. Your body, when vagal tone is good, what your body is hearing and sensing is I am safe. Mm -hmm. And if you are safe, then your body can digest, it can break down the foods properly, absorb the nutrients, your immune system is in hi in, isn't in hyper alert. So in our modern society, you know, this was another, I'm going to, I just going to take us back to Africa for yeah. a moment because we asked the Hadza chief, is there a word for depression in your language? And he looked kind of confused. And we kept through the translator asking in different ways. And we finally realized they don't have a concept of depression. They don't have a concept of stress. They are so resilient. You know, they live in the environment. They get wet. They, you know, things that would feel stressful to us there. It's just part of their daily life. But I thought that was really, really significant that they don't even have a word for depression. It doesn't even factor into their their makeup, the way they think about life. And yet, you know, in some cultures, there are multiple words for depression, for mood disorders. And it's all related to that gut brain connection. And it actually has to do with vagal tone as well. So vagal tone affects how your mind is feeling, it affects how your gut is feeling, affects how you're digesting. And breath work and meditation are the entry point for reactivating 
that vagus and rebalancing that and getting your body into that state where it feels safe again so that it can heal. That's really, really important. I love that. I think this, we could have a whole nother hour conversation on <laughs> this conversation, right? It's so important. Okay. One other thing I want to make sure though, to talk about, because this is a massive problem across just across the board. I feel like so many women deal with constipation and now we could go back and say, you know what, if you would work on your stress, increase your, you know, increase that vagal tone that in itself could probably get your bowels moving a little bit better. Right. You'd agree with that. Um, Absolutely. So, you know, so anybody who has constipation, you have to think about uh, vagal tone as one important key factor in in reactivating the the rhythmic contractions of the intestines that help promote the movement of the stool down. So I know you have you have a relaxed supplement, and I know you have some Ayurvedic. Uh, ingredients in there. And I wanted to ask you about this because I have never heard of it. Um, it's, is it pronounced trifolia? Is that how you pronounce it? Trifolia, which is a, trifolia. it's basically a combination of three Indian superfruits, we can call them, okay. that have different effects on the gut that help actually stimulate movement down the digestive tract, but in a way that's natural and not um, something that would be addictive to the digestive mm -hmm. system, like some of the other types of stimulatory laxatives that um, once you take them, you can become uh, basically your gut becomes addicted to them and you can't live can without you them. Mention that. Can you just explain that a little bit more about the problems with laxatives and why they become addictive to the gut? Yeah. So for example, like Senna, Senna cut, which is a stimulatory laxative, uh, when you take that, it's stimulating your gut, stimulating rhythmic contraction that actually creates changes in the gut that can be seen on a colonoscopy um, visibly. And when you over stimulate that system, then it loses its ability to sense the internal signals that are necessary in order to move things down. And, and oftentimes someone who is taking one of those remedies probably has leaky gut, has gut microbiome disturbances. So the gut microbiome is very important uh, for gut motility as well. So it's very important to have the right type makeup of gut microbiome for that. And and so a lot, these pe people who are taking this oftentimes already have other issues. And what they don't realize is if you're not addressing the underlying issues, um, you're not going to fix the overall problem, you know? Right. And I know that you deal sense. a lot with, yeah. I know you deal with a lot of um, pelvic dysfunction and. Yeah. And, and it's just women another... who are constipated. It just puts so much more unneeded stress on the pelvic floor. So that's one of the things I talk about. We talk about gut health a lot, which is why I was so excited to have your wisdom added because there's, it's, it's such a complex, it's a compl complexity, right? But I always find time and time again, when I get women to improve their gut health, oh my gosh, their pelvic floor dysfunction improves so much faster than if we're just focused we got to do the movement too right it's, it's kind of one of those you can't just do one thing but it's the it's the um comprehensiveness of everything but i always think the gut health is definitely something that needs to be worked on especially for women that have the constipation issue because it just puts so much stress on the pelvic floor um so thank you for explaining about the laxative issue because i think that a lot of people don't even understand that um so and you, you have to understand back. it's it's safer to use like an osmotic laxative that draws some more water into the gut because a okay. lot of um, people who are constipated are probably not drinking enough fluids or are having too much uh, types of drinks that are dehydrating, whether it's alcohol or coffee, caffeine. And so their stool tends to get very hard and then it's really hard for it to move down. So magnesium can be a really great um, part or either singular or as part of a supplement to help move things down 
the gut because it just draws some more water in there. And you also know that women who have pelvic floor dysfunction, sometimes they're not relaxing the right muscle at the right mm -hmm. time. Um, yeah. And that can make it really difficult to go to the bathroom. One thing that's really great to help with that, to give the body the right signals, is to use a, a squatty potty or like a stool that you put your feet on that then positions your pelvis in a much better position to be able to go to the bathroom and poop. <laughs> which is of course we were going to talk about poop today <laughs> always you can't talk about gut health without talking about poop <laughs> that was uh, my one viral video on on tiktok was basically yeah. on poop <laughs> yeah so funny it's it's like why is it so funny to talk about i talk about pelvic floor health all the time and the needing to relax women talk about they think you know, across the board, we talk about two week of pelvic floors, it's actually the opposite. And I'm glad you actually recognize that so many people, so many people don't. So um, yeah, it's you so can important actually, to relax. You know, yeah, and, and you can actually test this on MRI where they do uh, an MRI, uh, they call it a defecation study where they can show that the muscles aren't relaxing in the right way when the person is trying to go to the bathroom. And a lot of times, that leads to physical therapy, to pelvic rehab. Uh, but of course, and I love that you've got more of this holistic approach to it, understanding that the gut and the gut microbiome is a key essential part of the entire picture. You know, because you, if your gut is inflamed, then that's going to affect your pelvic floor as well. Absolutely. Because yeah, you, ju you just have more inflammation in your entire body. So Vincent, this is so great to get to chat with you. Um, I know there's so much more we could talk about. I'll have to have you back on another day so we can go deeper into some of this conversation. But will you just share with everyone where they can get your book? I know it's on pre-order right now. So, and yeah. I know you have some gifts and things for people that get the pre-order. I'm so excited for your book to Look, come out. I feel like it's going to be awesome for everyone listening. So <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, again, I just want to um, express my appreciation for being on your podcast. And I think, you know, sometimes we like to take things for a test drive. So I wanted to give people a test drive of my book. So for your listeners, I have a gift where they can get a free chapter in my book along with some bonuses um, and they can take take it for a test drive they can also see how they'll qualify for even more bonuses if they pre-order the book um, and it'll be open for pre-order from all the major book publishers amazon barnes and noble etc uh, and um, i know you'll you have the link, so you'll post the yep. link to, to I'll put my the link free, below for sure. Yep. Yeah. So it'll be it'll free free gift download at gutsmartprotocol.com forward slash gift. And I hope, you know, I just want to add value and I want to help people um, see the possibility that there is to heal uh, when they may not believe that the possibility exists. So hopefully with my my new book, my my goal is to help, you know, at least those 896 million people worldwide that suffer from IBS alone. And that's just yeah. talking about IBS. If we think about all the other gut-related health issues, um, it's so many millions of people worldwide that need this type of information and, and yeah, should be do. focusing on their gut health. Yeah, well, I appreciate and love all the work that you do. So thank you so much, Dr. Pedre, for coming on here and sharing so many insights. Thanks for having me.